Lame duck is a bit of a funny term in politics. Technically speaking, it just means a politician who's on their way out. Someone who's served their maximum allotted time in office, or who's lost an election and is on borrowed time until they are replaced. However, there's another connotation. When it's expected or known that a politician isn't going to win re-election because of a lack of popularity or some other similar case, they're often called a lame duck. To do whatever needs to be done At that time, Mr. to Reagan, preserve the this last and greatest bastion plan. of freedom. So to welcome the Jimmy Carter and his four-year-long lame duck presidency was, as can be expected, an important time for Democrats in the US. While the party had never actually lost a Senate majority across the 60s and 70s, to have gotten their man into the White House was a boost in morale for the country's Democratic supporters, and allowed for many Democratic politicians to get more into the swing of national policy. Biden's talk from last episode with Mr. Niet was one such part of that. But that does bring us on to our subject. We've already talked about Biden's positions on armed treaties and busing, which really were the highlights of his time during the Carter administration, so I'd say we should set the stage for what comes next, that being how the Carter presidency fell to the Reagan presidency. You get Vietnam, and you get the moral kind of failure of Nixon and Watergate as well. So you have this kind of economic crisis and decline and problems for the first time since the end of the Second World War. Series of events, all of which bring into doubt all of this success and apparent um, invulnerability of the United States. As a whole series of doubts and concerns and worries that are being created. And this is kind of context for Carter. So what Carter is really about is how do we how do we restore confidence? How do we restore um, our sense of ourselves as this exemplar nation? How do we restore the morality to American politics while also coping with some real realities, if you like, of, of, of decline of, of, of the Soviets catching up, of the Germans catching up and the Japanese catching up economically and so on and so forth. That all the points at dispute with his Arab neighbors or negotiable, that this year might be a time of success in the so far frustrated effort to bring permanent peace. Carter puts human rights, or tries to put human rights at the center of American foreign policy, is about trying to restore that sense of American uh, morality, about uh, the, the, the goodness and virtuousness of American foreign policy. If you like, Carter was trying to move on too quickly um, for a lot of Americans. It certainly wasn't something he was doing to win votes. He was doing it because he thought it was the right thing to do, uh, but it, 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 you know, it didn't have any traction with the public. Um, to the extent, uh, I suppose, probably the truth is most people didn't care one way or the other, or weren't even, didn't even know it was happening. But those who did know it was happening, the ones who were engaged, were the ones who were opposed to it. Reagan was very happy to sort of be aligned with with Rambo and Chuck Norris and the whole MIAs over there kind of stuff. And these are bad commies and we shouldn't have anything to do with them. You know, he, Reagan obviously goes back to the straightforward kind of Cold War, black and white world where the commies are the bad guys, we're the good guys. And that's the end of it. Whereas Carter was trying to move beyond that. Carter's chances at re-election were dashed by a number of things. His inability to fix the US stagnant economy, infighting the Democratic Party, family ties to Gaddafi's Libya, and reinstation of a military draft. But all of this was overshadowed by the presidential debate held between Carter and Reagan. Carter lost the presidency as much as Reagan won it. Reagan is, Reagan is an immensely, this is, this is another thing, Reagan is immensely likeable. His, polic his policies aren't, but he's an immensely likeable person. Uh, he's, he's, he's charismatic. Uh, he's excellent in front of a crowd. He's a brilliant speech uh, speech maker, uh, th and that comes from his acting background. He, he found it very easy to remember lines and speeches. He delivered them with the right weight, right gusto. Um, it, it, you know, it, it really was very, very good. Carter, on the other hand, is so ruled by public opinion, trying to do what the public wants that actually becomes hamstrung because you know you set a policy going one way and it'll change and then go back and then go another way and, 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 and it just be, becomes so inadequate. His way, way of governing is completely ineffective. Under Carter's ailing presidency and the tidal wave of Reagan's new popularity as the Republican Party's darling, the Democrats lost their Senate majority in 1980 and wouldn't get it back until 1986. So we leave the sole Democratic pocket of the 70s and 80s and head into the Reagan presidency, a time few Democrats remember fondly, but a time when Joe Biden became surprisingly more relevant than he had with Carter. His senatorial career reflects that kind of liberal, democratic, 
uh, thrust. Uh, so he is very much opposed to what is wrongly called the Reagan revolution. It's a convenient alliteration, but there was no Reagan revolution. Yes, Reagan turned the country right, rightward. What Reagan found was that he could never get rid of the social welfare state that the New Deal had created. Not the great society of the 1960s under Lyndon Johnson, uh, which targeted uh, African-Americans, but the um, uh, social welfare programs uh, that drew their inspiration from the New Deal and which benefited white Americans more than they did black Americans. Uh, you know, social security, unemployment insurance, Medicare. So all of these things, you know, Reagan wants to get rid of them, but he can't. And Biden plays a key role in the Senate uh, in limiting uh, the uh, uh, retrenchment of the New Deal state that the Republicans have in their sight. Among some in the party who became known, called themselves the New Democrats, um, um, organized around something called the Democratic Leadership um, Coalition. So this is people like Arkansas Governor uh, Bill Clinton, believed that the electoral success of the Republicans, or at least of Ronald Reagan in the 1980s, showed that the old model that the Democratic Party had been operating on since the 1930s, since the New Deal era, uh, was now out of date and needed to be rebooted. What they meant by the old model was the alliance of organized labor uh, and minorities in support of a, by American standards, a big welfare state, you know, the New Deal order, it's sometimes called. So the, the all of the federal programs that were created in the 1930s and then bolstered in the 1960s with the creation of Medicare and Medicaid, which created a national social security safety net. And it was that um, model, more than anything else, which Reagan overtly ran against. So, uh, you know, the he said, the era of big government is over. And in essence, that faction of the Democratic Party that I'm talking about around people like Bill Clinton and Al Gore in the 1980s uh, accepted that point. They came to the conclusion that they were not going to win national office again uh, unless they too accepted that quote, the era of big government was over. Reagan became president in January of 1981. Shortly after, Biden made his way to the Judiciary Committee, an organization that effectively manages every high level of legal paperwork that crosses the Senate, managing nominations to different Senate positions and reviews of legislation. Biden, at the time of his appointment, was the ranking member of the Democratic Party on the committee. He, he rises quickly through the ranks to become the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Biden would be around for many pieces of legislation, staying on this committee for a tenure from 1981 to 1997. During the 80s, though, he was renowned in this position for his popular reformation of the Comprehensive Crime Control Act. This act, if passed, would have been a firm and, as called by its detractors, heavy-handed way of adjusting the way various crimes were pushed and judged in law. Though even then, the bill's tough-on-crime nature would still taint Biden's reputation for his ranking position at the time it was passed, regardless of his attempts to remove its worst elements. After this, we roll into the culmination of Biden's career in the late 80s, his first run for president. 1988 had seen Ronald Reagan finally start to slow, with his term limits stopping him from running for president a third time. Meanwhile, his likely successor, George Bush, while still looking to be plenty popular a candidate, was still nowhere near the sheer charismatic force that his predecessor was. Many, Biden included, felt that this was the opening to again dethrone the Republicans after their having dominated the 1980s. He is now the chair of the committee uh, in, during the Bork hearings, and that gives him phenomenal, you know, senator from Delaware, you know, so what? Chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, the man who um, uh, stopped Reagan, uh, that's a different ball game. And of course, he, uh, re he, he, puts, he puts his name into the hat. Biden's campaign was confused from the word go, with his campaign management team being unable to pick out a slogan and suffering from internal bickering. He himself had actually been unsure to even run, only being encouraged into it by his family and colleagues after the Democratic Party lost its frontrunner to a personal scandal. He, he is not a great thinker. He's really, you know, what people 
claim Joe Biden, yes, he was a New Deal loyalist, but fundamentally he belonged to the Senate club. And Biden is very much at home in that milieu. You know, he is a very sociable politician. Uh, he is somebody who uh, sees himself as capable of getting on with uh, people of different political persuasion, partisan persuasion, uh, sees himself as someone capable of finding a middle way on which everyone can advance. That, that's good for the Senate, but wasn't, you know, it, it, it didn't cut much mustard when it came to uh, presidential primaries where you don't have to persuade Republicans. To vote for you. His strong position and look of authority that had been gained by his holding a senior position in the Senate Judiciary was dashed by his floundering start, being unable to relate to younger generations as he had in his initial senatorial campaign back at the start of the 70s. He'd raised more money than any other Democratic runner, but hadn't been able to apply it. Worse still, Biden was tied up in an ongoing controversy that was dividing his attention, that being the appointment to the Supreme Court of one Robert Bork. Presidents get to nominate uh, Supreme Court justices, but these have to be confirmed by the Senate, and uh, they have to undergo a grilling by the Senate Judiciary Committee to check their views on these things. Bork sort of uh, stand up uh, and, you know, he's questioned, well, where do you stand on the Civil Rights Act of 1964? And, you know, he says, well, of course, uh, this is uh, an unjustifiable expansion of uh, federal authority. Uh, these questions should be left to the state. He's really, really opposed to abortion. He says there is no right of abortion guaranteed anywhere in the Constitution. They invented a new right, the right to privacy, to justify uh, Roe versus Wade. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, that is bad constitutional law. By August, Biden's campaign had lost steam between his divided attention and his manager's divided ideas. Michael Dukakis would take the Democratic nomination, and then lose the election to George Bush Sr., giving the Republicans four more years carrying them into the 90s. Funnily enough, another lame duck. 